All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to 2022's version of the Trinity series. Now, I did this several years ago, and uh, there's some doctrines that I want to revisit every few years, doctrine of God, the doctrine of the Trinity, doctrine of salvation, and so on. So uh, if you were in this class maybe five, seven years ago, I think, um, it'll be a similar teaching because, strangely enough, the doctrine hasn't changed. Um, <laughs> But uh, our understanding of it needs to be revisited. You know, the Apostle Paul in some of his letters, he said, I want to remind you of some of the things that I've already taught you. And that's what this class is about. So we're revisiting this teaching, the doctrine of the Trinity, because it is crucial to understand this teaching as a follower of Jesus. Now, when it comes to the Trinity, um, there's different views out there. Some people think that the whole doctrine of the Trinity is, uh, is a mystery, They'll say, you know, this is just something that you can't understand. It's not understandable. You just can't get it. So you just have to accept it by faith, and it's beyond our understanding. Other people say, actually, no, it's a logical contradiction. Some people say it's an irrational doctrine. It makes no sense whatsoever, and it's irrational, and it can't be true. Um, but I would say this, that when you properly understand uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, it's neither of these things. It's neither this major mystery, nor is it uh, certainly at all a logical contradiction. So what do we mean by the word Trinity? We're going to embark on our journey today. What do we mean by the term Trinity? Well, I've given you this quiz at the beginning, okay? Now, uh, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I don't want anyone to be embarrassed. Um, but here we go. Christians believe that there are three gods in one. That is false. Christians do not believe there are three gods in one. Now, by the way, we put this out on our social media this past week, on Instagram and that. We, we put this quiz out, and hundreds of people uh, saw it, thousands of people viewed it, and many people uh, voted, you know, and so we got the result of the vote. And this was as of Friday, so uh, uh, Friday morning. Uh, on Online, of the people who viewed this and answered, 89 said true, 63 said false. Think about that. 89, more people believe this. They said, yes, Christians believe that there are three gods in one. We do not believe there are three gods in one. We'll explain why we don't believe that. Second one, Christians believe that God is a person. This is a trick question. The answer is false. We believe God is personal, but not a person. The key word there is a, underline the word a, a person. No, we believe God is three persons, one God, not a person. But this is a heresy that God is a person, as we'll get to in a moment. Um, well, actually, we should, and by the way, online, 58 people agreed with that statement and 90 disagreed. So 90 people got it right and 58 people got it wrong. Number three in your quiz, Christians believe that there is one God who first revealed himself as the Father in the Old Testament, then as Jesus Christ for 33 years, and now as the Holy Spirit. 111 people agreed with this statement. 26 disagreed. It's false. That's false. That is a heresy called modalism or monarchianism, or sabellianism, named after a guy who taught it, Sibelius. That is not true. If you were raised in a oneness Pentecostal movement, a Jesus-only Pentecostal movement, this is the heresy you were taught. And this is the heresy that God is one person, and he revealed himself as the Father in the Old Testament, and then he switched roles and became Jesus for 33 years, and now he is the Holy Spirit. One person who took on three roles. That's a heresy. That's not biblical Christianity. Okay? Sorry to tell you that. <laughs> Number four. Christians believe that God created the Son, and then the Son created the universe. That's false. That's called Arianism, not A-R-Y, like Nazi, but A-R-I, named after a guy named Arius, who, who first... Uh, proposed this back in the 200s. Um, 18 people online agreed with that, and 114 disagreed, which is very encouraging. That is what Jehovah's Witnesses teach, that Jesus is a created being, and then Jesus created the universe. That's a heresy, and that's not what we as biblical Christ followers believe. 
Uh, number five, Christians believe that three persons combine to form one person. That's false. Again, that's illogical. But that's what some people think we teach, and so they struggle and say, that's irrational, but Christians believe that. No, we don't believe that. By the way, online, 44 people said yes to that. 86 people said no. Okay? So all five of those are false. As Christ followers, we do not, orthodox Christ followers, small o, orthodox Christ followers, we do not believe or teach any of those things. Okay? So what are the basics of the Trinity? Well, when it comes to views regarding the existence or the nature of God, there are essentially five options. This isn't on your outline. This is for free. You can put it somewhere on the side. First of all, there's atheism. Atheism. Now, ah, this is from the Greek word, ah meaning without, theo, uh, theism. Theos is God. So, ah, theism, without God. So that's the belief that there is no God. That's one view, atheism. There is no God. Then there's the belief that's known as polytheism. Some of you, if you were raised in an Eastern religious background, this is what you would have been taught. Uh, poly means many. Okay, like polyphila, lots of ways to fill things. Poly, uh, so many gods. So they say, no, it's not that there are no gods. They say there are many gods. Okay. Uh, and then there's pantheism. Again, if you were in Eastern religion, you would have probably been raised a pantheist to a degree. And this is the idea that pan means all. And that's the view that all is God. So nature is God. This God is in, 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 in everything. So that's when people who worship God, uh, worship creation, they are pantheists. Okay, and then there's a, an, another view. This is kind of a unique word, a ne unique view. Panentheism. <laughs> this is, pan means all, n means in, and theism, or theos, God. So that God is in everything. So how this is a bit different is they believe that um, the universe is God's body. Just like a hand fills a glove, so the glove is the universe and God is the hand. And so um, we'll put uh, God is in the universe. We'll put it that way. A little bit different so, uh, than pantheism, but it's nuanced. So God isn't the universe, but he's in the universe. Uh, that's not biblical Christianity. Well, actually there are... If I'm not mistaken, I think Orthodox churches, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, teach a version of this, if I'm not mistaken. I think I saw that on one of their websites a week or so ago. But they would say that God is not complete without the universe, which is not a biblical understanding. We believe God is imminent and transcendent. So he's present in creation, but he transcends it. He's above it. Um, so, so what does the Bible teach? Well, that's the fifth option that's on your outline. We're finally getting to your outline, to the first blank. The Bible teaches that there is one God. That's your first blank. Bible teaches there is one God. And this is called monotheism. That's the next blank. Monotheism. Mono meaning one. Like you have stereo and mono. Uh, monoism, monotheism, which is the, uh, the belief that teaching that there is one God. Mono meaning one or singular. So, the three major monotheistic religions in the world are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all teach that there is one God. Those are all the three major what are called monotheistic religions in the world. Okay, They agree that there is one God who is personal and is distinct from the universe, his creation. Okay, So monotheists would say, again, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all believe God is personal. That God is not just a force, which is what many pantheists would teach. Um, that God is just an energy. Um, that's Eastern mysticism. That's not biblical Christianity. Um, and so Jews would not teach that. Um, 
Jews would not teach this. Uh, Christians don't. Islam does not teach it. Uh, the three major monotheistic religions all understand God as a personal being. And we'll unpack what the word personal means more a bit today because that's crucial. What sets Christianity apart from Judaism and Islam is the concept of the Trinity. Essentially, the Trinity is a, is a reliable litmus test for biblical orthodoxy. Orthodox meaning correct or proper or right. So it, it's kind of a litmus test where you can find out if, if, a, if you want to know if a group is orthodox or correct or biblical in their view, the, one, the first thing I actually go to is what's their view on the Trinity? If they deny the Trinity, then I know they are off on a tangent, that they are a cult or they are non-Christian at their core. The first thing I look for is, what is their view? Are they Trinitarian in their teaching? And you say, why is that so important? Well, that's what the next few weeks are going to be about. We're going to see how the Bible clearly teaches the, the doctrine of the Trinity. And we're going to unpack that doctrine. And at the end of each class, I do my best to, and today we should have lots of time, I think, uh, to, to discuss and answer questions. So I love, as you know, if you are in these classes, I love the Q&A afterwards. That's probably my favorite part of the week is the Q&A. So feel free to shout out questions or ask questions. And you can always preface your question with, I have a friend who wants to know. <laughs> okay. So that, let, let's have that understanding. I have a friend. Everyone say that with me. I have a friend who wants to know. Okay, so we all have stupid friends. <laughs> and you're here as their spokesperson today. Okay, here we go. So, number two, the Bible teaches that this one God is tri-personal. T-R-I, personal. Tri-personal. You know... We all, as children, probably grew up using a tricycle. It's a tricycle. What does tricycle mean? Three wheels. Tri, okay? Um, and that's what we're talking about here. We believe the Bible teaches that this one God is tri-personal. Now, what does that even mean, tri-personal? Well, now, in interestingly enough, this whole concept of personhood all came out of the, uh, oh, I hate these brushes, all came out of the, uh, the discussion amongst Christians back in the third, fourth century, second, third, fourth century, on the whole understanding of the Trinity. Prior to that, it, there was no words, there was no nomenclature for the concept of personhood. Um, uh, Aristotle talked about humanity as a rational animal. And the church fathers agreed with that concept. We're a rational animal in the sense of our bodies are animal bodies. They are. They're part of the animal biological kingdom. But we have a rational soul. So Aristotle called humans rational animals. And the church fathers agreed with that basic concept. Yes, we are rational animals. We are. That's why you could um, use animal organs and so on within humans to a degree. They're transferable, some of them, okay? And uh, because biologically, we, we, we share a lot of similarities, physically. But what, where humans are different and made in God's image, and we're going to unpack this more next week. Next week, uh, I'm going to note to self, we are going to explain more what it means to be made in God's image, okay? We're going to start uh, uh, with that a bit next week. But within, we are souls. Now, Humans aren't the only beings with souls. Many theologians, many philosophers believe that um, lots of other animals have souls, but just not at the level of the human soul. Um, it's believed that monkeys, dolphins, for example, have higher levels of soul than, say, uh, a, a, a turtle or an iguana or something. So there's higher levels of souls, but humans have the highest level. We have rational souls. And this whole concept then of personhood began to be developed around the whole Trinity uh, doctrine because they had to have this understanding. When we say that God is three persons in one God, what is a person? And so they had to dis you know, um, discuss this uh, and, and describe this. And there was no verbiage for this prior to this. All this thinking came out of this discussion. Um, so essentially, 
Uh, and this isn't on your outline, but it's important to understand this. So when we talk about a person, we're talking about a mind, but a mind of a higher order. Uh, we mean a center of self-consciousness. That's what we mean by a person, a center of self-consciousness. The ability to, um, to say I, say or think in the concept of I. I want, the first person, that's what we're talking about. The, you have a first person perspective where you can say, I want this, I think this, we desire this. That's first person perspective. Um, first person perspective is I, second person is you, and third person is they. And uh, when we're talking first person, we're talking uh, the I perspective. So, for example, a dog is not a person. Why? Because dogs are, do not have a, an I concept. My dog is home right now, and he's not at home thinking, I am really hungry. <laughs> Animals don't think in that term. They don't have that part in their brain where they think I thou. The I thou concept, uh, me, you. Dogs go on instinct, but they, they don't have that sense of I and you. That sense of, of themselves as separate being uh, from another being. They don't think in those terms, okay? That happens in the prefrontal cortex, which they don't have at this degree. And so we talked about previously uh, what makes humans so unique, and we'll touch on this maybe next week more, will intellect, a spirit component, and emotions. We talked about this a few years ago when I did the series on the soul, SOS, we called that series, where we unpacked what is a soul and where do we get them and what do they do? And remember we had that set of drawers on the stage, the, the, the chest of drawers with four drawers. And we said the soul is that whole chest of drawers, but it, I remember by WISE, W-I-S-E, um, each drawer is a different function of the soul. It has a will. We're not going on instinct like animals. We have a will, volition. I want this. I'm going to do this. I choose this. Uh, so there's a will. We have intellect. We're rational. We have that spirit component, which is unique. We have component where we can interact with God. And emotions, the, the, the sense of feelings and emotions. That's unique to the human soul. And this is all part of what makes us a person, or what makes uh, a person a person, okay? So, we're talking about God is one God, one being, with three persons, three minds, three centers of self-consciousness, three perspectives that say, I, I, I. But one God with three centers of self-consciousness. Now, what are the opposing views, and we're going to be unpacking this over the next few weeks. Um, what are the opposing views regarding the Trinity? Well, as your outline says, A, there's what's called Unitarian. And this is the idea that God is one being representing one person. Unitarianism is the teaching that God is one being, so they agree there, but that one being represents one person. Again, that is... Uh, one of the falsehoods that we looked at earlier, it's called modalism, uh, where God has, is the one God revealed himself in three different modes, uh, three different uh, perspectives, three different uh, roles. That's, as we said, oneness, Pentecostalism, Jesus only Pentecostalism are modalists, and they're Unitarians. Muslims are Unitarian. Uh, Jews are Unitarian. They believe that God is one being represented by one person. As a human, you are Unitarian by experience. I am a Unitarian by experience. Meaning, I am one being representing one person. And that is our experience as human beings. That's how we were created. So it's like, I can't say, hi, I'm Darren and I'm Joe. No. I am one. The rule of thumb for humans is one person per soul. The soul, the human soul, is home to one person, okay? You can't have two persons in one soul. Why not? Because that's not how we were created. We were created to be one person, one person per soul, okay? Um, but 
Jews and Muslims believe just like you, that, that believe God is just like you. God is one being representing one person. However, as your outline says, letter B, there's the view, as opposed to Unitarianism, Trinitarian is God is one being representing three persons. God is one being representing three persons. That's what Trinity means. The word Trinity means tri, short for tri-unity. Tri-unity just evolved to Trinity. Tri-unity, three united in one. Tri-unity is Trinity. Again, on your outline there, I, I had, so let's take a moment, I said, to understand our terms. When we say one being, three persons, by the, by the term being, we mean one substance, one essence, one nature. Substance, and forgive me for having to be so specific here, but we really need to understand our terms. Substance means underneath standing, substance. So substance is that the basic, stuff. And stuff is a bad word because you think material. But it's the basic essence of a, of a being or of something. S what stands under it and supports all the properties that it has. The substance is the most basic form, the most basic nature, the most basic essence. You can't get any more basic than the substance. Okay, It's, it's the essential nature of someone or something. And what we're saying is God, and person, as we said, is the center of self-consciousness. So we're saying that God is one substance, one soul, the, the essential substance of you, um, apart from your body, is your soul. That is the essential substance of you. You are a soul in a body right now. And when your body dies, you still will exist, and your essential substance will be your soul. And that one person abides in, or rides upon, or fills, if you will. These are all physical terms describing non-physical things. That's our challenge. But that one person, which is you, uh, is attached to the substance known as your soul. God is one soul, home to three persons. It's really not that mysterious. It's not necessarily it's not our experience of life, but it's not all that mysterious. It's different, admittedly, but it's relatively simple. One gentleman who's a former Muslim who is now a Christ follower, he put it this way, and I, I thought it was pretty profound. God is one what, but three who's. God's one what, but three who's. I am one what and one who. My what is, and you, you are one what. You are a human being. A human soul. You are one what? And you're one you. Who? I am the who, Darren, who lives in what? This human soul. God is one what? A soul. Immaterial. God is immaterial. It's not a physical being. God is one soul, but three who's abiding in that one soul. Okay? Simple concept, as your outline says. I'm repeating a lot of this, but we need to get it into our brain. A human is one being, it's your outline, a human is one being which supports one person. God is one being which supports three persons. Okay? It's pretty simple, actually. Um, how is this even possible, you say? I mean, how is this even rational? Well, I would ask this, what about this is irrational? There are actually no logical contradictions here, none whatsoever. Um, the only time a logical contradiction comes into play is when you portray one of the false views as a true view. Like to say, we are monotheists and we believe three gods are in one. No, that's, that's irrational, but we don't believe that. That's irrational. Or three gods, three persons are one person. Well, that's irrational, but we don't teach that. What we do teach is three persons in one being. That's not irrational. It's not our experience of reality, but so what? We're not made in, God's not made in our image. We're made in his image. What does that mean? We're going to unpack more of that next week. But the, the concept of the Trinity, properly understood, is entirely rational. It's very different from our experience, admittedly. 
But again, what's the big deal? What makes us think that God's experience of reality has to be identical to our experience of reality? And I, my favorite story when it comes to this is the story of the barnacles. I believe like C.S. Lewis told this story. I have my own version of it, but it goes like this. You know, we know barnacles are those little crustaceous things that stick to the rocks and bottom of boats and things. Well, there was uh, deep in the, uh, in the bottom of a lake or the ocean, there were uh, two barnacles sitting on a rock, and they were talking to each other. And they were discussing whether or not humans existed. They'd never seen a human. They'd heard rumors. And so there were some people who believed that humans existed, but they hadn't actually seen them. So they were having this debate on whether or not humans existed. And as they were debating back and forth, a wise barnacle rolled by on a shell. And they said, oh, wise barnacle, we have a question for you. He said, yes, what is your question? They said, oh, wise barnacle, do humans exist? And the wise barnacle said, yes, humans exist. And they said, oh, tell us about, uh, about these uh, humans. And they were kind of laughing because they didn't believe humans existed. They said, tell us about these humans. And the wise barnacle said, well, Humans do not have shells. Well, they laughed. Every barnacle knows you got to have a shell. If you don't have a shell, the fish will eat you, right? Like, duh. Tell us more. Humans do not need to stick to things to live. Well, this was hilarious. A bar part of being a barnacle is sticking to things. That's who we are. We stick to things. So, okay, whatever. Well, wise barnacle, tell us more. Humans. Do not live underwater. Oh, well, they fell off their rock when they heard that. <laughs> because every barnacle knows the whole universe is made of water. That's all they've ever seen and known. They've heard rumors of non-water, but every barnacle knows that water is all that they know. What was the barnacle's problem? Their problem was they thought if God existed, or they thought if humans existed, humans had to be a different, a, a, a version identical to them. And we fall into the same problem. We think if God exists, what we tend to do is picture God as an elderly man with a long beard on a throne. Now, admittedly, he's portrayed on a throne, but those are called um, uh, anthropomorphisms. It's a fancy word. Write that down. Use it at the water cooler on Monday. <laughs> anthropomorphism, meaning we, we project, we speak of God in human terms. We do this with animals too. Oh, my dog is really angry at me. Or my dog, he really wants this. Or my dog's thinking, how dumb are you? No, those are, I'm projecting onto something human qualities that they don't actually have. And we speak of God. God himself spoke in those terms. He talked about my arm is not too short. God doesn't have an arm. But he's speaking in anthropomorphic terms so we can understand what he's trying to communicate. But we tend to think, we, we take that stuff literal, and uh, it's never intended to be literal, those poetic devices, okay? God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God doesn't have a body. He's omnipresent. He doesn't have a body that's limited to a time and space, okay? Latitude and longitudinal points on a compass or on a map. Um, God does not have a body. Now, that's what made the, the incarnation of Jesus so incredible. He, for 33 years, took on a body. And we'll talk more about that and all the implications that had, perhaps, later in this series. Okay, here's a common objection. It's on your outline, number three. But you'll hear people say, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. And they're right, it's true. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but as your outline says, this fact is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Strictly speaking, the term the Bible is not in the Bible. Um, the Greek word uh, for book is, but the Bible in the sense of a capital word, a capital letter word describing the, all the scriptures together, that's not in the Bible per se. Um, strictly speaking, omniscience, the words omniscience, omni omnipotence, omnipresence are not found in the Bible. But their concepts are, the concepts that they represent are certainly found in the Bible. So the word Trinity agreed, it's not in the Bible. But the concept that Trinity represents is in the Bible. At least I'm going to do my best to show you that it's in the Bible over the next few weeks. You have to be, decide whether or not you agree or not. Number four. As it's repeating what I just said. The concept of the Trinity is in the Bible. The word isn't, 
But the concept of the Trinity is in the Bible. Trinity is a word that is used to summarize the result of a systematic study of everything the Bible teaches regarding the nature of God. We've done this before in all the other doctrine classes we've done. We've said it's a systematic study. That's how you produce a doctrine. How you produce a doctrine is you do this. You gather together all the verses in the Bible that have to do with a certain subject. So you read them and you list them and you write beside them what is that verse or that passage teaching. So every verse that has to do with a certain subject, you write it out and then you put beside it, this is what that verse seems to be teaching. And then you gather together all the thoughts that all of those verses seem to be teaching. And you summarize all of those thoughts and teaching into a simple statement, as simple as you can. And that simple statement is called a doctrine. And I've heard people over the years say, oh, we don't need all these doctrines. What a foolish thing to say. What an absolutely foolish thing to say. People who think that are called cult members. <laughs> because to not, to understand, under, doctrine is what the Bible teaches. It's a systematic, so you systematized it. You, you, you've pulled it all together and you've written it down and you've shown it, um, how they rationally are teaching these things and then you've summarized it and into a doctrine. Doctrines are essential. They're a concise statement, a summary of what the Bible teaches. When you say there is one God, that's doctrine. When you say Jesus is the Messiah, that's doctrine. Doctrine is essential, okay? And you're not wasting your time. In fact, we're called upon to study the word of truth and to handle the word of truth carefully. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about all scriptures God breathes, useful for teaching, correcting, training, and righteousness. That's what we're about to do over the next few weeks. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look through what the Bible teaches regarding the nature of God. Is God mono or uh, polytheistic? Um, what does the Bible say about the nature of the Father? What does the Bible say about the nature of the Son? What does the Bible teach about the nature of the Holy Spirit? And when we pull all these things together, so what is the Bible as a unified body of, of writers uh, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, what are they saying about the nature of God? So next week when we get together, we're going to talk about the nature of God, mono versus poly. We're going to talk about... Okay, time to wake up. <laughs> We're going to talk about the nature of the Father next week when we get together. And we're going to learn a key insight next week regarding the words the Bible writers used in describing the Father and how that word that they used impacted um, when people often say, how come the Bible doesn't come right out and say Jesus is God? It's true, the Bible rarely says that. We are going to show instances where the Bible does. The biblical writers do actually come right out and say it, but they rarely do. Why is that? There's a very rational, understandable reason why that is rarely said in the New Testament, because it would have confused people, and we'll learn a bit more about that next week. But I have five minutes right now to conclude with questions about what we've learned today. Anything we've discussed today? Yes, Walter. I think those could be synonyms, though when we say supports, I mean in the same sense that your soul supports or is home to your personhood. And I'm speaking, using that word in the identical way. Yes, who... Well, he took on the form, but that's a bit different because that was a, more of a temporary form because it says earlier in that passage, who Jesus, who being in very nature God. Um, so that's talking about the substance, the very essence. He then added the form or the appearance of a man. So it's kind of a little different. Here we're talking about the soul is the substance the, the source, the substance, the, the home field, if, you're making, if I'm making sense, the, the home turf of those three persons. Yes? So what about my friend Iron? Yes, yeah. <laughs> 
this question of the three Christians who teach that there is one God and and that's wrong. That's wrong. Yes. Exactly. Great question. And I'll repeat the question for the camera, people who are watching at home. So um, why is the, th th the third one wrong where it says Christians believe that God is one God who first appeared as the Father in the Old Testament, then as Jesus for 33 years, and then now as the Holy Spirit? Why that is wrong essentially is because that... That is teaching that there is one person and that one person acted in the role of the father for centuries. And then for 33 years, he took off his father hat. So it's just me still. I'm, I'm, I'm God. I'm the one person. And then I take off my father jacket and I put on my son cap. And for 33 years, I'm the son. And then I'm, I am crucified. So essentially the father is crucified. But in the clothing of the son, and then I, the Father and the Son, change robes again, and now I take on a, a white robe of the Holy Spirit. It's the one person who just, is, it's a one-act play, or it's a one-actor play, and I'm just taking on these three different roles, or modes, and that's why it's called modalism, and it's a heresy. And um, it's not true. What we are going to learn, the Bible teaches, is that the Father is a distinct person, Distinct from the Son, who is distinct from the Holy Spirit. In fact, we can take you to passages of Scripture where all three are present and interacting at the same time. Yeah. And so it shows, it's, and people have often asked, well, who is Jesus praying to in the Garden of Gethsemane? If there's just one person, he's talking to himself, which is odd. Um, but he's not, he was speaking to the Father. Um, in the limitations that his humanity placed upon him. So this is all profound stuff, but yes, so we're talking about three persons sharing one being. So it's one being, like you're one being, God is one being, but your one being is home to one person, one center of self-consciousness. God's one being is home to three centers of self-consciousness. They're in absolute agreement, in absolute unity, because they're all omniscient. They all, one doesn't know something, the others don't per se. Uh, they all have the same loves. They all have the same desires. It's one being sharing the same essence. Uh, absolute unity. Try unity. Trinity. Because um, I, I said so. That's why. <laughs> why is number five one wrong? Christians believe that three persons combine to form one person. Be God is three persons in one, one being, three persons. So what, why five is wrong, Christians believe that three persons combine to form one person, that is saying Christians believe that three centers of self-consciousness all combine to form one center of self-consciousness. That's not what the scripture teaches. They retain their distinctiveness in their unity. Yes, over here. Yes. Oh, what a great question, which tells me that you've been exposed to Jehovah's Witnesses over the years. The question is, when we see Almighty God, does that mean the Father? And Mighty God, does that mean the Son? No, it doesn't. Now, admittedly, in the Old Testament, when you see God or Almighty God, that they are thinking Father. Yes which is one of the challenges the New Testament writers had in the New Testament. Because they wanted to communicate that Jesus was divine, as had been revealed to them, but if they said he was Almighty God, then they're thinking, oh, so Jesus is the Father. And that's modalism. That's what we just learned is wrong. So they had to think of a way of how can we communicate this new reality that has been revealed to us through the resurrection and life of Jesus. That, we'll unpack that more in the weeks to come. Great question. Stay away from those Jehovah's Witnesses, though. <laughs> yes. So, in the personhood, and there's a big controversy happening right now, does it start at conception or at birth? Does personhood start at conception or at birth? I don't, certainly wouldn't be birth. Um, th this is a mystery that we talked about in our doctrine of the soul, the doctrine of, of man. When does 
um, the soul impart or it, it connect with the body. And we're not sure. There's different theories. It's called traducianism. There's called uh, epiphenomenalism that it kind of eventually happens. Tradush Some people say that it happens right at conception, that a soul is when the sperm and the egg combine right away, the soul begins there. Um, we don't know. Scripture doesn't say. And so uh, we just don't know. But I would definitely say it's not something that ha personhood isn't something that suddenly happens at birth. I'd say it's certainly much further before that. Yes. Different from a what? A being. As I, I, I don't think, Dwayne, you were here when we said at the beginning that the whole concept of personhood is something that there was really no nomenclature for before the, the Council of Nicaea. Um, there was no, Aristotle called humans rational animals. Um, but this whole idea of personhood is something that evolved in human thought over the centuries. But a being, by implication, is a center of self-consciousness. A being, if it's a rational being, is because you can have animal beings and you can have spirit beings uh, that say I and you and uh, that are rational. And so by definition, by implication, a being has personhood in the sense that a being has stands in I-thou relationships. Me, you. And anything that can stand in a first person I-thou relationship is by definition in human terms, uh, in human understanding, a person. It's a personal being. One last question. Yes. Who's the Lord of Psalms? We're going to get into this. It's God, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead. I'm going to get too far ahead of myself. Remember that question, because whenever you see Lord, it's usually capitalized, L-O-R-D, right? All capital. And um, we are going to discover that Whenever you see the Lord all capitalized in the Old Testament, that's the tetragrammaton. It, it, it's the Hebrew word Yahweh or Jehovah. And, uh, but they uh, didn't want to ever say that word. We don't know how it's pronounced. Is it Yahweh or Jehovah? We don't know because ancient Hebrew had no vowels and because Hebrews would never pronounce this word because they feared mispronouncing it and breaking the commandment. So they inserted the word um, kurios, which is the Greek word for Lord. And, but they capitalized it. So you knew whenever you saw that, it's talking about Yahweh. Remember that because the New Testament writers used that as a way of getting around the God Almighty, Father being God thing. And it's fascinating how they use this. Next week, hope to see you again, folks, when we pick up talking about what is the nature of the Father. God bless you. See you next week, Lord willing.